one. All right. My name is Michael Primo. Uh, I'm an artist and journalist based in um, Brooklyn, New York. I work in a bunch of different mediums, films, photo, audio, installation. Um, and I'm also uh, often labeled an activist. And I've never once ever called myself an activist and I, I resist that term vigorously and vehemently. Um, for a lot of reasons. Activists, you know, as an artist, activist art is usually like relegated and like dismissed as not aesthetically rigorous. Um, as a journalist, being an ag activist is the kiss of death, as though this myth of objectivity uh, isn't inherent in bias, as though, you know, a white male heteronormative reporter perspective is somehow the medium and baseline in which I should aspire to. But I, so I resist the word activist for a lot of different reasons. And, I, and through this process, I've been called to story. Because I think story does two things. It either confirms the status quo and maintains it, or it confronts the status quo and disturbs it. And there are only two ways that it does this. Um, and I, I've sort of walked through this process of, of realization by recognizing in my own development the power of story to unlock the radical creative imagination, to be able to dream new worlds and new ways into being through story. And story allows us to practice these possibilities in ways that I think are profound and profoundly simple. I mean, any parent who loves story time at the end of the day knows the power of story. And that's a tradition that's as old as people um, have been alive. And so, the idea, I think, that brought me to this understanding is an idea that's a little bit hard to talk about. Um, and it's this idea of love. And, I mean, we're in the Bay, so I feel like we can, you know, we can be a little touchy-feely, and that's cool. Um, and I'm from Brooklyn, and, you know, I'm here to spread love the Brooklyn way, so I, one of these things will even out, you know? Um, but, you know, I, you know, I come from a world where, where love was a weakness. Love was a, a way of, of not being your true self. Um, it was a way of getting eaten by the wolves, walking to school in my neighborhood. You know, you never showed love. So it's taken me a while to really come to this understanding to allow myself the space of emotional vulnerability to be able to talk about love, talk about a deep love, like a generous love, a kind love, um, that love that can't feel my face kind of love, can't feel my body. I didn't know love was like this until I felt this love kind of love, you know? And, you know, I love the people, and that's why I do the work that I do, and that's why I'm inspired by all these people in this room, and, and, and deeply grateful that for Wendy inviting me here, deeply humbled by the people who I follow, who I inspire me daily, um, because it's this love for the people. It's this love that has fueled my continual belief that we can be better. Uh, it's this continual belief driven by love that is allowed me to understand that we are constantly evolving, that we can be better than ourselves, better to ourselves, better to our communities, better to our loved ones, better to our friends, better to other life on this earth, better to this planet. But, I mean, it just so happens that I live in a world that doesn't fully value my existence. And that's not some like, woe is me type of statement, it's just a reality. It's an acknowledgement that we live in a system that's governed by three pillars. And those pillars are patriarchy, white supremacy, and capitalism. And those systems govern and shape the world in which I live, the world that I did not choose to live in, but this is the world in which I live and in which I have the opportunity to, to make a choice about, to navigate it with love or to turn away from that and navigate it some other way. But, I, but I've chosen, chosen love. And, you know, this system of patriarchy, white supremacy, and capitalism, these are systems of domination and extraction. You know, these are systems that just see things as binaries. They don't understand gender as a spectrum. It tolerates rape, and it excuses the murder of children as though that's okay because of X, Y, Z. You know, this is that system of domination and extraction. And so what I'm interested in is how we can transform to a system of replenishment and balance. And patriarchy is not a solely a challenge of, man, of men, for men, as white supremacy is solely a problem for just white people. Um, and white supremacy isn't about swastikas and, and, uh, um, and white hoods. It's about privilege and understanding this privilege. And too often in this activist world, we use privilege as a bludgeon 
to separate us. The same way this system of domination and extraction pits us against each other is the same way very often that we use an understanding of privilege not to understand how we can begin to love each other more deeply by identifying the similarities that bring us together rather than looking at the differences that bring us apart, right? And so we have this profound opportunity to do this. And that's not activism. I shouldn't be called an activist just because I give a fuck. That's my general perspective, you know? And so these are problems that we all face. These are all our challenges. Um, and these systems of thinking have, have shaped, shaped the way we think and shaped the way we move and shaped the way that we tell stories. It shapes who tells those stories and who has the power to tell them and how they are distributed. And we have this profound opportunity right now. And that opportunity is either to push forward and to understand, motivated by our love, that we can have a social and economic transition. Because the choice is transition or collapse, both ecological collapse or social collapse. It's, it's inevitable if we don't fully embrace the love and the power for us to transform ourselves in a way that we all know we can. It's the, it's the mother's love, the father's love that, that, that understands that there are infinite possibilities if, if love is just embraced and spread and shared and supported, right? And so that shapes how I do my work. Um, I have a string of a body of work that um, I call participatory documentaries that are all about trying to re-understand and redefine for myself the process of collaboration that brings the people who I have blessed me with the privilege to be able to share their stories with me, to be able to take into account their wishes, their dreams, their hopes in the shaping of the work that I do. And I have a bunch of projects that um, approach the work in this way. Um, a couple on climate change and resistance, Sandy Storyline and Water Warriors. I'm working on this project now, uh, which is a digital series for PBS on the military-civilian divide. And again, it's a project that when uh, the Corporation of Republic Broadcasting approached us and was like, look, you know, there's so many military people who are isolated and siloed. Um, they feel stigmatized, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, well, let's have a, a, a frank conversation about this and, and talk meaningfully. You know, I deeply respect people who, who, who sign up for the military for a variety of reasons, signing up for God and country, signing up for uh, education and opportunities just to get out of their neighborhood. Um, and I also know the reality that 900 bases in 130 countries is not protecting your, your country, it's maintaining an empire. And so how do we look at this in a way that is um, cogent and in something that we came up with, and we came up with this through the process of active collective participation and engagement of communities directly affected by the issue that, look, you know, you often hear about the military veteran who, quote unquote, is crazy. And I was like, well, let's look at this a little differently. Let's, let's look at this not as though the impact of moral injury or soul loss or the impact of engaging in activities that, that go against our fundamental moral compass as an isolated issue. Let's look at a society that's incapable of dealing with mental health. And so then we begin to not understand this as a veteran issue or a military issue, but as a social challenge and a social opportunity to begin to deepen how we think about emotional vulnerability, how we think about war, how we think about empire, how we think about patriotism, to deepen and contextualize that. And I don't think that what I'm doing is anything new or anything different. Um, I, you know, I, I stand directly in a tradition that, that dates to people like Ida B. Wells and Ida Turnbull, Turnbell, um, to Jacob Rees, the great photographer Gordon Parks. Um, and one of my, and Nellie Bly, can't forget Nellie Bly. Um, one of my favorite stories about Gordon Parks, for those who don't know who Gordon P Parks is, you better ask somebody. Um, you can Google it right now. Uh, he took a few photos, made a few movies. I'm pretty sure his movie was the, uh, the, movie, the Hollywood movies he made were the first major Hollywood movies made by a black director. I'm not sure if that's true. I'm pretty sure that's true. Um, and prior to that, had an illustrious and important career as a photojournalist. And his first ever assignment was at Life Magazine, um, his first like real kind of job. And Life Magazine reached out to this young black photographer and was like, yo, you know, uh, this is in the mid 40s. And they were like, we want you to go up to Harlem and we want you to, to, to follow around, you know, a young at-risk kid or whatever, whatever they called it in the 40s. Um, and so Gordon Parks um, went up to Harlem and met this young man named Red. And this young man named Red was just, you know, struggling with the trauma of poverty, just trying to make ends and trying to make sense of his world. And, you know, was caught up in a little bit of chaos, uh, just trying to get out of that world. And 
Gordon Parks had the privilege uh, of following this kid around um, for, I guess, a week, two weeks, and um, saw this kid doing all sorts of things that a kid does in the neighborhood uh, when he's just trying to eat and trying to survive. And it was an era when uh, photojournalists gave their whole roles to the editor. I'm just, you just gave them and you walked away and then the editor developed them and figured them out. And so um, he, gave away his, he gave his roles over to the editor and then he came back for a meeting like a week or two later and they were like, look, man, this is, this is, this is extraordinary work. Your work is important. You're going to be somebody someday uh, and we're going to make you that way. Um, and the image that we want to run is this image that we want to put it on the cover. And it was an image of this dude red with a gun with, like, with smoke billing out of it that he had just, just shot. And Gordon was like, no, 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 you, you cannot share that image. That image is going to fuck his life up. You cannot share that image. It's going to, you know, kids in his neighborhood are going to come after him. The police are going to come after him. You cannot show that image. Life magazine was like, no, no, we're the journalists. This is, this is, this is the most important way to tell this story. We have the objectivity to determine what's best for the story. And this image is the story that needs to be shared. Gordon was like, no, there's no way you can share this image. But they were like, no, this is, this is what it is. Take it or leave it. So Gordon left that night, and uh, what he did next is, uh, is, is kind of interesting to me, kind of inspiring, I guess, and why I like this story is that he broke into the Time Life building at night. He somehow got up to the floor where the dark room was, which was somewhere up in the 20s, uh, in this massive building in the center of Manhattan, and he broke into the dark room, and he stole the whole sequence of photos that were the photo of that kid doing what he knew because of his active engagement and participation and collaboration and love for this man who had blessed him with the opportunity to come share his story and be in his world. And he said, no, this is going to fuck up this kid's life. There's no way this image can ever see the light, light of day. And he broke in that dark room and he destroyed those negatives. And he destroyed all... Um, only those negatives that he thought would be endangering to him. And, you know, Time Life, obviously, they flipped out. Um, we're like, you know, I can't believe this. No, this is crazy. Well, that's the image we were going to put on the front cover. You know, kid, you had your opportunity at your first Time Life cover, but no more. And they ended up putting some general on the cover. Uh, the irony, I guess, of that, right? Um, but they still ran the story. Because the story was a story that had to be told. And he told it in a way aesthetically that was beautiful, in a way that only Gordon Parks could tell. And he still became Gordon Parks. And that story for me is a story of love. And that story for me is a story of integrity. And integrity to the people who have blessed you with the opportunity to tell their story. And that wasn't an act of an activist. That was an act of somebody who was in love with the people. And, you know, a smart man once said, if you don't love the people, you'll eventually betray the people. You know, he, he's resting in power at this moment. And so I guess my question for y'all is, how does a love of generosity and a love of understanding inspire you to do the work that you do and in the way that you do it? And how does it move you to be a better person as an individual, be a better person to your family, have better families, have better communities, have better lives, and find a way to live in balance and live in a way that like replenishes and finds balance with earth. So that's, that's just a question that I ask myself pretty often. It keeps me up at night. I don't sleep much, but you know, that's the way of the world. So I, I thank you very much for the opportunity to come and chill with you. Thank you.